Welcome to Electron Line. Here we're going to start a new series in mechanical engineering. We're going to talk about the internal forces on beams. And those, of course, internal forces are caused by external forces. So let's take a look and see what the, the external forces are that we're concerned with. Well, first of all, we have two types of loads. We can have what we call a concentrated load. And here we have examples of that, F1 and F2, where we have a large force applied to the beam at a particular spot. So we assume that's at a particular spot and not distributed over any distance. The second kind of load or force that we can have that, that is applied to a beam is what we call a distributed load, where the force is distributed over a certain length of the beam. It can be the entire length of the beam or it can be a section of the length of the beam. It's a certain number of newtons per meter or a certain number of pounds per foot. So the units are typically in force per unit length. And then we typically have the reaction forces, the forces that hold the beam up. Typically it's at the ends of the beam, but it doesn't have to be. It can be at different portions of the beam, but at some point the beam needs to be supported. There are cases where the beam is only supported on one side and not on the other side, and we'll see examples of all that. Now that we understand what the different forces are that can act on the beam, you may have noticed that all the forces tend to be perpendicular the way we've drawn them. And when we talk about the internal strength of the beam, in order to withstand what we call shear forces or bending forces, we have to have a strong beam. In order to make it a little bit easier to calculate those forces, we're going to only consider forces which are perpendicular to the beam, not at an angle. We can do that later, but for now, we'll just concentrate on the perpendicular forces. So, what do these perpendicular forces cause? Two things. They cause shear forces and bending moments inside the beam. In other words, when you apply a force in this direction, and then you apply another force in this direction on the beam, at some distance and some distance between them, you cause forces or stress on the beam that could potentially shear the beam if the forces are greater than the shear strength of the beam. In most cases, of course, that's not supposed to happen, but we should be able to calculate what those shear forces are to make sure that they're within the limits of the strength of the beam. A second phenomenon that occurs is, for example, we have a beam resting on the supports right here, so we have reactionary forces, and then you have a load towards the center of the beam, or really anywhere along the beam. This would cause the beam to tend to bend so we have these bending tendencies in the beam. In other words, we have what we call a moment that causes. Notice that when the reactionary force pushes up here and the load force pushes down here, it would tend to cause the beam to bend. And we then have internal moments trying to oppose that bending. The stronger the beam, the less bending we have, the more that the beam can withstand and oppose the bending forces that we have here. So we will we'll explain and concentrate on how to calculate the shear forces and the bending forces on a beam. Now, sometimes that's a little bit more complicated and a little bit confusing, but we're going to do it in a very systematic fashion so you can really understand how that actually works. So that's the beginning of a new series. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. This is where we start.